what is the latest? What are the latest developments in the twenty first century of fetal medicine? You know, there are the modern field surveillance. Um, there are advanced fetal imaging screenings, diagnostic tests, which makes the diagnosis of the fetal disease more personalized. We have interventions available, and we will be talking about the future directions of what we can do in the, in the, in the field of fetal medicine. So. I know that the topic of this talk is about fetal intervention, but I don't think I can complete the whole picture of fetal medicine without having some introduction on, you know, on, on the whole scheme of what are the latest developments. People, use, people always say that you know, I established a fetal intervention in Thailand, which is not true. Actually, this is the, the pictures of my old men, I mean, this is Professor Chan Chai and Professor Su Jin, and you know, they went to um, stay with Charles Roddick for, for a couple of years. Actually, you know, Professor Jin, he, 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 he was in the same class with Kiprosic colitis. So when, he, when they returned to, to, to our center, they brought, back, they brought back all the knowledges, and this is the, the pictures of them um, doing the first um, in utero transfusion at, at our center. So it's quite historical. This is the first vitoscopy set at our center. It's very antique. Of course, we're not using it right now. We have much, much better you know, installment um, in our unit. But this is just how, so that you see that you know, things that you will see in the next 15 minutes doesn't happen, did, did not happen, did not start to happen yesterday. You know, it has its own history. So right now, you know, our, our video intervention units are like a mobile unit because we do not have the OT for ourselves. You know, the operating theater at, at my center is a shared facility. Every second counts, so we have to move the patient in and out, you know, at a very fast pace. Otherwise, the hospital will not pay. So, you know, when we get in, you know, we just move all the instrument in, you perform the surgery, and then we move out. It, it's pretty much like a like a military movement. All right. So we have to make sure that we exercise, you know, our resources to the maximum benefit. Um, before we go to the um, to the intervention, we have to make sure that we make the right diagnosis, right? So, and by the way, all the pictures that you see here, you know, are from my unit, all right? So it's not like a Google pictures, even though if you can Google it, just so you know that, that they're from my unit. So, you know, you have the other sound that's getting very much better. You know, we have a term called sonoembryology. So it means that you can track the development of the embryos that you used to see in a textbook that it has to be in a uh, histo uh, histological section, right? But right now you can study it using another sound. Actually, the, the, the development of ultrasound was so advanced that it gained public attention. In 2013, um, Time Magazine, like the, the New Year celebration, you know, it put a small article about the 3D HD ultrasound with a heading called Womb with a View. So it underlined the importance of you know, how ultrasound nowadays have played a, an important role in fetal diagnosis. Starting from eight weeks, you see the amnion, and what is the importance of the amnion? Because sometimes the amnion can cause the disease. If that amnion happens to be broken prematurely, um, you see the amnion as well. You know, in the twins, this is an example of monochorionic diamnic twins. You see a very thin layer of, of amnion between the babies. And if that amnion happens to be broken, either you know, by us doing the procedures, or it could happen spontaneously. There is a consequence call. This is an example of hydrogenic septostomy. That you know, if you do the amniocentesis in twins and you are not careful enough and you break the amnions, this friable layer of amnions could be intertwining around the limbs of the babies, and it could cause ischemia and autoamputation. We can get in using vitoscopy, as you saw earlier, called a very old instrument to cut and release the band, but it would be much better if that doesn't happen at the beginning. So at nine weeks, you start to see some limb movement, and you start to see that the baby looks you know, more like human. And um, again, you know, certain diseases could be diagnosed at this stage. For instance, cystic hygroma, you see this is a bony part of the baby, and you can see the subcutaneous fluid collection underneath the skin. What is the importance of cystic hygroma is that, you know, if you see it, you have to classify it into either it has septum on the inside, because if it does, 
then the septated type of cystic hygroma carry a much worse prognosis than the non-septated type. And sometimes the cystic hygroma is a very transitional binding. So it occurred and it just goes away. So you cannot catch it at 12 weeks because we know right now that first trimester screening is quite prevalent. I'm not sure about the situation in Pakistan, but um, um, in Thailand, because it's government subsidized, you know, people are getting the first trimester screening, like most of them got it. So it's our job to pick up this condition because if something bad develops after this and we do not have any prior knowledge on what does a baby look like in the first trimester, we may miss a very important information if we should offer the, the invasive treatment or not. Sometimes the cystic hygroma just turn out just, just, just further develop into congenital lymphangioma and that could obstruct the airways of the baby, which I will show you later that we have to handle it, to handle it with, with, with exit procedures. If it's getting very bad, it could develop high drops. So usually cystic hygroma with high drop is 100% mortality. So you should, you should not attempt to do any heroic intervention for, for this baby, all right? You see a, a huge amount of skull edema. Of course, I mean, 3D pictures looks beautiful, but it's not just the beautiful, it's not just the pretty, prettiness of the image that we look at. We use the 3D other side to communicate with the patient. When we say to the patient that, okay, your baby is swollen, they don't really understand what does it mean. But you know, at 13 weeks, if we are able to produce this image to the family, it's gonna be able to shorten our counseling time. We have a term, like a nickname for the virtual, Feel laparoscopy, you know, when the baby has significant ascites, you can pretty much like peek into the belly of the baby and see all the internal organs. Again, this is not very fun to look at because you know, it means that this baby is very, very sick and we don't like to see it very so often. I think there will be a speaker talking about the fetal behavior you know, later. I mean, 3D ultrasound allowed us for picking up the, 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 the facial expression of the baby in the womb. The baby doesn't look the same. I and mean, people will always say that, okay, the fetus is fetus, they look all the same. They, they don't, actually. Um, some minor changes or deviations, like the low set ear, could signify you know, many syndromes which could be related to chromosomal abnormalities or it could be related to, to genetic syndromes. And many times it means that the baby will have some degree of delayed neurological development. So, Beware of the, the, the facial, the cranial facial structures of the baby is, is something that's quite telltale. Again, why I'm talking about this? Because if you have a baby with a condition amenable for fetal treatment, for instance, the baby has congenital diaphragmatic hernia that is amenable for fetal tracheal occlusion, and you see cleft, and you see low set ears, this baby may not be a viable candidate before you can prove that the baby doesn't have any associated chromosomal or non-chromosomal anomalies before you start sticking the scope into the womb of the mother. All right, so make sure, again, the, the cranial fa facial profile is quite important. Make sure that you look at it thoroughly before you offer any treatment. Aside from the, there are many things, you know, the subtle anomalies that you can look at, you know, the face, the ears, the genitalia. Um, I'm not sure if it is a gender sensitive society here, but, um, in, in some other countries, you know, if you can reveal the gender, um, the gender is something that, that can tell us about the, um, the, the condition of the baby. For instance, this is a micro, example of micropenis, hypospadias, you know, the, the, um, the fetal micropenis can be associated with a number of syndromes as well. It's not just that looking at the gender just for fun, okay? So we are taking it um, quite seriously, okay? This example of the micropenis before birth and after birth. Um, these are the clinical relevance. On um, you know, when you see the baby with short penis, it's not just short penis, and you see the opening. Actually, you can you can witness that the opening of the urethra is not at an appropriate location. So it could be associated with many other syndromes. Again, for babies like with posterior urethral valve that is amenable for in utero treatment, if you see an associated gonadal or or KUB anomalies, you might be a little reluctant to offer the invasive treatment to the baby, and this is how, why it raises up. There are like modern um, um, modalities for the ultrasound for you to take a look at, especially for the musculoskeletal assessment of the baby. 
I know the pres Professor Kilani is very is an expert on the on the musculoskeletal outer sound. But you know, when you talk about the musculoskeletal system of the baby in utero, it's another realm. Okay, foot, on the foot you see five toes. That's it, everyone can see that. You see five toes, that's very easy. How many toes you see here? You see six. So again, I mean, and the polydactyly could be related to, to, to a number of, of syndrome as well. So this baby will be able to prove that this baby has other multiple like subtle anomalies. And you know, the micro array test proved that the baby may have a very high tendency of delayed development in the future. So the, the parents decide to terminate pregnancy. Short bones as well. You know, you see short bones. You see the 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 the, um, the baby in a very odd position. Um, also, genesis in perfecta and tantoporic dysplasia. Right now, is subjected. It's also a viable candidate for the for the in utero um, gene therapy and stem cell transplant. But I don't think it will be too much if I include that in this talk. But just so you know that e even the, the musculoskeletal disorder, you can detect it early enough, you might be able to prevent further fractures in the future. Evaluation of the, of the skeleton can be done by an ultrasound. We used to believe that it had to be done by x-ray, right? Everyone knows about the baby gram. You, you, you take the x-ray of the baby of, that, that is aborted or after the baby is born. But actually, ultrasound can do pretty much the same thing. And open neural tube defects is also a big problem in the region. And even though we can prevent it with folic acid supplement, it's not that enough. The cranial valve, the skull, is one thing that we can evaluate you know, using the, the silhouette mode. And you can actually picture the skull plate one by one. And you can show if there is any deformities. I can go on and on you know, about the, the neural sonogram, but I think it's going to be that kind of boring. It's just so you know that. Before we start offering the treatment, thorough investigation is needed. This is an image of posterior fossa at 14 weeks. This is an image, and just so you know that this this picture, and we, we do this all, all the time. This was done like two days ago, you know, in, in, in my unit. And this is an evaluation of the baby with a prior history of unilateral ventriculomegaly. So again, you know, we use a 3D ultrasound to demonstrate the brain and even the posterior fossa could be evaluated, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and the cystinal magna could also be seen. So pretty much, we can do pretty much about you know, everything you know, with the ultrasound. But I will show you an additional um, usefulness of the MRI later, you know, before we start offering the treatment. The conjoint ways we can show this, the bone of the baby. And actually, the spine could be seen as early as eight weeks in the conjoint twins. So with all those images, I think many of you might be suspected, oh, this guy is, is full of shit. You know, he must have used all the, the Photoshop all the time to get that beautiful image. So this one, you know, we published the, the 3D sonoangiogram of a pair of conjoint twins, which subsequently was successfully separated postnatally. And right now, both baby girls, they are girls, they are doing fine. I had a chance to evaluate this pair of conjoint twins. It was a thoracal omphalopagus conjoint twins. And um, back then, the sono angiogram was new, so we used that to evaluate the vascular connection between the babies, and we did not find any significant connections. The hearts are joined, but it was separable, so I concluded that, okay, I, I talked to the pediatric surgeon team, and we had a multidisciplinary approach at my center that, okay, these babies should be able to attempt to at least go to attempt a separation surgery. And yes, it, it was a successful surgery. So we published that in White Journal, and this is the, the original image that was done 10 years ago. So again, it's not just, first of all, I don't use Photoshop, all right? So everything that you see is original image. And, and if I can do that 10 years ago, I mean, with all the, the, the capability of the other sound nowadays, I think it's a piece of cake for you guys to, to reproduce that. Oh, it's a sales thing. So this is it. The, the book of mine that just came out last year. So you guys want to know the techniques, then you can just go online and see it. So now we talk about the 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 intervention. Most intervention performed at my center is laser for twin twin transfusion syndrome. Um, in monoclonal twins, if one baby die first, the other one, 25% uh, of the survivors will have the cerebral palsy. So we offer the, this is, these are the, the, the treatments that we're offering. We can offer the, 
the laser, we can offer the radio frequency ablation or port clamping if needed, if that if one baby is hopeless. Let's look at the the laser to begin with. So this is the posterior placenta. This is the anterior placenta, the radio frequency ablation, and the bipolar port clamp. So we get in, we, you see the anastomosis, right? The artery and the vein. So for the anterior placenta, because the placenta is on the front, so we need a special technique in order to get to the anastomosis. For this, the RFA, oh, let's go this first. This is the bipolar cord clamping. We use the, the mini bipolar to clamp the cord. If one baby is very sick, and it seems like the baby will not be able to make it, so we do the cord clamping. And this is the RFA, you, you, we do the internal coagulation. This is pretty much done in your cardiac fetus. And all the procedures are performed um, under local anesthesia with a mild degree of intravenous sedation because these are done on the placenta or the umbilical cord and not on the surviving babies. You see the anastomosis over here, right? And we zap it with laser. You see the anastomosis over here, we zap it with laser. You see the intertwined membranes, right? And I'm still trying to grab the cord here. Why the RNA is very easy procedure. I got it done like within 30 seconds. So, Again, I mean, the fetal intervention is getting more and more routine. And um, I think the most important thing is that you just have to recognize it early enough because if you recognize it too late, then there will be no intervention in the world that can save the babies, all right? Um, this is our statistic. You know, we got 80% single survivor um, and about, um, we got about 60, I'm, I'm sorry, we got about, yes, we got about like 80% single, single survivor, we got about 70% of the double survival which is quite comparable to the to the to the global statistics. So I mean after a while, I mean you, 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 the technique is pretty, it's pretty much standardized, so it, it doesn't really matter you know where in, in the world you perform the procedure. It's, it's a very standardized technique. So we do the MRI. If one baby happened to die prior to the laser decolonization, we offer MRI. I know that are quite a few MRI facilities in Lahore. We use 1.5 Tesla MRI for the brain evaluation. Only if needed, we, we use three Tesla. But because three Tesla has much less evidence for the field of safety, so we try to avoid it. And MRI can pick up <laughs> subtle changes in the brain of the baby more effectively. And that's the reason why we add it up. If we could not find anything on the ultrasound, we, we top it up with MRI. But if the ultrasound is quite obvious, we don't repeat with MRI. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia, is a hole in the diaphragm, and the liver and the bowel kind of came up to the chest of the baby. This is an example of the left side, which had the bowel getting in the chest, and the right side, which has the liver getting in the chest. Left and right side of CDH are totally different diseases. They carry much different prognosis. They carry a very different you know, um, disease courses. Right side of CDS carry a much worse prognosis, and it, it carries a, it, it usually we offer the um, the tracheal occlusion, meaning we get in the trachea of the baby to occlude it to allow for the lung to expand, so that the baby can survive long enough to get the the, the, the corrective surgical um, procedure after birth. We offer it whenever the the the, the, the residual lung volume, either measured by the ultrasound or the MRI is lower than 25% of the expected volume of that particular gestational wage. And this is the balloon that we use. We use gold balloon 6.5, and this is how we get in. So you inject the baby with a cocktail to make sure the baby is calm enough and relaxed, and we give them atropine to make sure that while we are manipulating the trachea of the baby, the heart rate will not drop. And we get in the trachea, this is that on this side is the is, is epicotis. You got down to kill the baby, this is like 27 weeks baby. You see the carina, which is the bifurcation of trachea. You put the balloon in, you lift it a little. Just imagine the distance between the, the larynx and the carina is maybe three centimeters. So you do not want to overdo it, all right? If you overdo it, you just pull it out. If you push it into the, the balloon will be in one of the bronchus and not right in the middle of the trachea as we expected. All right, so we deploy the balloon and we shake it, and, the, and this is where the balloon is. We remove the balloon at 34 weeks. Depends on the situation. We can remove it, you know, vitoscopically, like we reverse the procedure that what you just saw, 
or we can do the exit. Exit, it means that we perform all the procedure when the placenta is still intact, so the baby doesn't have to breathe, the baby will still get oxygen for the mother. And um, this is how we do it. So just so you know, this is just, just so that because I, I believe that you guys have read about the exit procedures, you have read about the tracheal occlusion all the time, it's just an opportunity for you to see what, what the real life circumstances and we, we verify the, the procedure of the balloon with the MRI. For the posterior visual valve, you see the bladder of the baby dilated. The key factor, if the baby will survive, is that if the kidney is still functioning. You know that kidney is a filtration organ, so we need to make sure that that filtration is still fine. This is an example of the, of the, the pyelectasis, but you can still see the branching pattern all the way to the cortex. This is how the, the non-functioning kidneys look like. So this thin wall of cortical layer is not functioning anymore. You don't see any branching. You see the vessels straight from the renal artery to the cortex. So this is not a viable, not a functioning kidney. So we are not offering the treatment to this baby. Sometimes we are not sure. We offer them MRI just to make sure that this is a normal cortical appearance of the baby. This is when all the all the cortex are gone. You see the hypo signaling of the cortex. So this has not been to be safe. Even though the baby has posterior visual valve, we see the baby too late. Then no treatments will be offered. But this is the one that will be benefited the most for the treatment. So when you see the posterior visual valve, you see the distally distended bladder, you see the distended popular reefer, we can be shown on the on the inversion mode of the 3D other sound is the bladder and the distended uh, proximal urethra. Using the, the surface mode, you can notice the trabeculation, which is the, 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 the hypertrophic changes of the detrusive muscles. So you see that the muscle is kind of bulking, and you see it is an evidence of a prolonged obstruction. So we know that this is something, there's a physical obstruction going on there. So I'm a trained urologist, so whenever I do surgery, I scrub in with a PUN urologist. And the way that we do is that we get in using a curved scope, and um, we orienting it to the proximal urethra. If it is a foul, this is the proximal urethra that is dilated. If it is a foul, you see like a triangular piece of tissue with tympanic movement when you push it with saline solution. Again, I'm not a trained urologist, so I have no idea what valve looks like. He will tell me that, okay, Tom, you go, this is amenable for the, for the treatment. Tom, stop it. This is not, this is not the case. We should, we should abandon the procedure, all right? So we work as a team um, um, back, 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 back there. Right? So we just pop in that valve. We stop the bleeding with laser at a very low um, of power because we don't want to burn the whole thing. And then, you know, on the other side, you see the mucosa of the urethra, actually. If you pop it, and then you see the ambient cavity, then I'm sorry, you can't treat your false track, and that's, that cannot be good. So the field tumor is one thing that we manage all the time. Um, with this kind of tumor, you see the deviation of the airways. So the baby may not be able to breathe at the time of birth. And if you deliver this baby, and you cannot secure the airway within four minutes, the brain is fried. It's partially gone, it's completely gone. It depends on how long you spend to secure the airways. So that is how like that is how like you know we 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 secure the airways you know on the exit basis. The principle is that you know, we have a protocol. And this protocol is mounted on the side of the OT because everyone will want to help. When this kind of baby is about to come out, that will be like a pediatrician. And that's the physiologist, ET specialist, fetal medicine specialist, operation of the nurses. There will be the, at least 20 hands coming in at the same time. And we can't let that happen. So we have a very standardized exit protocol. And, and everyone will know that position. So there will be a limited number of people present. Even though everyone wants to see the baby at the time of birth, of course. You know, everyone excited. But, but if it's too crowded in the OT, we cannot function appropriately. So we have a very strict protocol. An example, so the tumor at the neck of the baby pick up by an ultrasound, the MRI showed a very solid tumor, and with a slight deviation of trade here. Again, you deliver the baby without being so sure you can secure the airways in time, the baby might die. This was 10 years ago. It's me when I'm like this big, right? So this um, me, two neonatologists, 
my assistant. So we got the baby out, we flip the baby to the position where they can get the tube in. If they cannot get the tube in within two elevation of the, of the L, then the ENT specialist will step in and then they will do the, the laryngoscopy using the flexible um, fiber scope. And then it, it will be followed by the, the, the tracheostomy if needed. So we got the baby out. Trust me, I did not break this. This one was broken already when they got the baby out. And you can see that the fibrin coverage of the of this of this tumor. It means the tumor grows very fast in utero. So luckily, it was a benign tumor. It was an infantile myofibroma, and we were able to completely remove the the fibroid. So the critical period actually is at the time of delivering the babies. You know, without a very good team and very well organized, you know, the baby may not even survive the 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 delivery suite. So I'm not saying that we can save all the babies, all right? We have limitations, you know, we are not God, and we accept that. So the example of the tumor at the frog mouth, and you see that this is the, the face, right? And you see that practically the whole mandible is gone. The whole mandible turned out into a very, like, tumor, huge tumor with a very high um, vascularity. The, and actually that tumor, and you can, can barely visualize the you can see that actually the, the, the palate of the baby is being invaded by the tumor. So with this kind of tumor, we call it epinatus, it's a kind of dermoid tumor, we don't offer a treatment, we offer termination. Because even though the baby survived, you can see like the mother baby exploding into, a tumor, into the tumor, the baby cannot really swallow. So even the baby survived, it means that the baby will survive without a mandible. And you have to do the whole reconstructive surgery. And that cannot be good for the quality of life for the baby. So it looks like the whole mandible is gone. You see that the tumor actually is protruding through the nasal space as well. What I'm trying to say here is that case selection is important. So even though you can do exit procedure, it doesn't mean you have to do it you know, in every case, all right? So in another case of the of the epinatus, you know, it involves the, the base of skull, you can invade into the brain of the baby as well. And this is a hideous tumor and you do not want to see it. Um, for the lung lesion, you know, um, you know that lung is quite vital for the survival of the baby. You have the, the lung mass that compresses the, the, the physiology of the lung and the baby may not be able to breathe appropriately at the time of birth. So we offer the shunting procedure. Um, just example of how cruel people who see this, this clip always say that you know, I'm a very brutal person. You just have to get the baby into the position. You push it to the side, you stabilize the baby with a probe, and then the other hand is you get the shunt in. I'm doing the shunting procedures. Now we are getting the shunt with a small tube, draining the fluid from the lung to the amniotic cavity. This is in order to release the pressure continuously and allow for the growth of the lung that might still be good. You see that I start to release the first coil of the shunt and then I would withdraw it very slowly. This is a real-time clip, all right? So this, this is just so you know that, again, I don't Photoshop and I don't edit the video. So that you will see, I am clumsy. You know, I'm not that fast, okay? So you release the first coil, then then you pull the, 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 the puncher, the, the obturator out, and then you twist it and you push it back. You release the second coil at the skin. So usually the total time that we take, it should be around like a few minutes. If you take longer than that, it means that you are, you, you are having a problem, all right? Because you know, then the, 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 the fluid in the lung will collapse. You, you're losing your space to operate. So I tend to put the, the shunt kind of in the back. Because you put it in the front, the baby can pull it out easily. When the baby is well enough, trust me, the baby is very vigorous. You know, it's just pull it out every time. So you just put it in the back, and the baby cannot pull it out. So it stays until the time of delivery, all right? So, and you just clamp it, you know, and then and then remove it. I will skip the open surgery because we are not really actively doing it right now. We are we are we are we are bringing it in, but it's not very active. So maybe in the next two years you will see something new. Um, for the solid lung lesion that you cannot put the shunt in, like this is a solid CPAM that push the heart to the side, push the lung to the side. How can you reduce the size of this solid lung lesion? We have a treatment called percutaneous chlorotherapy. Um, we use the epoxy chloro. You have to be very careful because if you push it hard enough, you know that CPAM is actually the bronchial 
more formation. So it has a connection to the other lung. If you push it too hard, then that sclerosing agent will spill to the other lung and cause damage. So first rule is do no harm. So we gently release the epoxy sclerol into the mass after decompressing it. And then um, just observe the progression. You see that the, the, the tumor size drop, all right? The high drops improve. And you see the subcutaneous edema is gone. The hydrocele is gone. And, but the baby still requires surgical removal, you know, of that other residual lung tumor after birth. The last disease that is amenable for treatment is chorioangioma. It's a tumor in the placenta. And it could present in various forms and shapes. Um, sorry. It could be embedded, you know, inside, protruding outside like cauliflower. It has a, a, a variety of, of treatment. I'm sorry, a variety of appearance of, of chorioangioma. So in a mother presenting with polyhedramnios, make sure you look very closely because many times you just miss it. You just miss it because it, it, it can present in various shape and form. So the way that we do it is that it can cause heart failure, apparently, because of the chunting effect within it. Um, we can measure the MCA PHV, the example of the, of the fetal anemia. All right, you see the ascites, all right? So we measure the maximum velocity of the, of the, of the middle cerebral artery. And just look at the scale over here. We, I can go up until like 120, and that is huge. It means that the baby is severely anemic, all right? So once you get that, the treatment is you get the transfusion. It means that you get the, 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 the blood transfusion to the baby in utero. You have to carefully the volume very carefully because just please be reminded that this baby is having heart failure already. You don't want to overdo the transfusion, otherwise you kill the baby with the transfusion. But if you you don't give the baby enough red cell volume, it will not improve anything. So we use it the, 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 the specially prepared blood with 80% inadequate, it's very thick, to reduce the volume, to increase the red cell mass. And we do not do the exchange transfusion. We just we just push it and kind of bolus those into the baby and kind of follow up, you know, on the MCVA DSP later on. But if that cannot improve the condition of the baby, we have an alternative source of energy to burn the tumor. But before we do that, we have to make sure that it's safe to do it. Um, this is a publication from my fellow um, that was in prenatal fetal vaccine therapy two years ago. Um, we did a study trying to find the right algorithm because the heat convection of the RFA is different. You guys are radiologists, so you know RFA very well, right? The radio frequency ablation, right? As a radiologist. So because we know that the heat convection is totally different, you know, in, in various tissues. Liver tissue is the one that RFA was designed for. So before we use it for the other tissue, we have to know what is really the real heat convection, what's the real average we should use before we adapt it, you know, in that. And this, you know, when we adapt it, when we want to burn the chorea angioma, we use the angiodynamic one, by the way. I'm not advertising for them, but, but because they, um, I think it's, it's good because it, it has kind of, it can expand up to five centimeters, which is more enough for us that you can see how we burn on the inside, just to, just to decrease the vascularity of it, all right? So I'm going to end my talk here just like that. This is a very brief summary of the whole thing. Actually, I can go on to like, for the CDH, you can have a two-day talk just on the congenital diaphragmatic hernia. All right, just to give you a brief idea of what is going on in, in modern um, fetal medicine. It involved accurate diagnosis. It involved the personalized um, 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 categor categorization of severity. It involved minimally invasive. We can go open fetal surgery if needed, but we try to limit to, to limit that because of the maternal risk. And at the very end, you before you adopt the fetal therapy into your institute, you require very good genetic counseling. And you require a very solid ethical guidelines to make sure that you do not bring the babies that do not require any surgery at all and to have it and reach the baby without any proven benefit.